Welcome back. Another episode for the archives. If it's me speaking to you and I'm super stoked to be talking to my boy. It's been a hot minute. We're just trying to figure out when the last time we chatted. We chatted a few times over on the other podcast at Conspiracy Farm and he is back or he is here for the first time being introduced to the It's Me Speaking To audience. Man, he's an author. He's a researcher. He is killing the game, ladies and gentlemen. He's one of those people I like to call, and I coined this term, he's an, he's an alchemical agent of altruism, if you will. He's been very giving of himself and his time. And when I say alchemical, he's not transmuting lead into gold, of course. But through his work, through his research, he's, he's helped transforming people from one state to another. And that's mostly having to do with elevating their consciousness, if you will. I'm so thankful he's here, and uh, it's been it's been a minute. Matthew Lacroix, welcome to the program, sir. Hey Jeffrey, it's always great to be back on talking to you. You're one of my favorite people to talk to, so I appreciate you setting this up so we can have a good conversation today. Absolutely, man. And I, you know, I am I am a Padawan learner that enjoys sitting under the learning tree of Matthew. He is the Jedi Master, and you know, I'm going to do my best to try to keep up with him. I mean, through his work and through his research, and I've always been fascinated by the conversation of ancient civilization, ancient technology, you know, where we came from. And Matthew has gone so deep over the years. He has a couple of books, The Illusion of Us, The Stage of Time, and he has another book he's working on that we're going to talk a little bit about. But before we get into it, Matthew, what have you been up to since we last talked, man? You have been very, very busy. Yeah, that's an understatement. It's certainly been... <laughs> Um, I call it the last year, but especially also I would say like the last um, the last few months have been uh, quite a whirlwind. I've been um, doing a lot of filming for different places. I got a chance to go out to Los Angeles and film for the History Channel. And that's something that I wish I could go into more details and talk about, but I can't yet. But other than that, just, you know, that's something, an announcement that's going to come down at some point when I can. But that was a really cool experience to be able to do that. Um, and along with that, at this, in the conjunction of that, I've been filming for some really good shows on Gaia and really transforming and doing some new things that I would love to just briefly share. Um, there's a couple, there's a couple new things coming like Beyond Belief and there's going to be, um, another, um, another show with Regina Meredith coming open with Open Minds coming soon. We're actually going to be doing a dual show with Billy Carson. On, on Open Minds, which is going to be just phenomenal because Billy and I work so well together and that's just a, a great platform for us because Billy's going to be in town for the Ancient Civilizations Conference at the Guy Sphere, which I may be involved in involved with as well. Um, and besides that, I think the biggest thing to share in terms of filming for Gaia that I'm very, very excited about is that I've played a very significant role in helping redesign um, the new season and seasons going forward of ancient civilizations. So we've put an enormous amount of time and effort into redeveloping that show. So, I mean, it's it, the previous ep seasons were definitely, it's definitely good. I, in fact, that's the reason I'm at Gaia because I, I did really much and very much enjoy that show a lot, but we were doing something very special with that show. And I want to strongly encourage people to, get excited about that because I've put my heart and soul into that um, to give it a bit of a new direction, a new focus, which is very, very evidence-driven now, um, very credible, really just goes over what the science, what the evidence, and then what our uh, hypothesis is for different aspects of understanding the, the focus of these civilizations that existed before the Younger Dryas, before 12,000 years ago, this high level of sophistication that existed around the world where most of these incredible structures like pyramids and megalithic walls were built. And so what we do in that is we're really breaking it down now to a level that is really, I, I personally, and this is not just because I'm involved, but I think it's unmatched of anything on TV. It's something that really is quite compelling and um, not only did I do a lot of the writing and the research to design that, but I'm also in it a significant amount. So I'm really very proud of that. And that's going to be dropping in September, the the first episode, and then going forward on that. So I'm really excited to share that. There'll be a, a trailer on my channel coming out that I'll be putting up for that. And on top of that, the 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 solo show that I did on Billy Carson's Forbidden Knowledge TV channel he Billy has put uh, quite a bit of effort and money into that show, and that is also going to be 
quite significant that I'm excited about where I did all my own episodes. I recorded a whole season called Mystery School of Truth, and that is also going to be coming out in September or October. So those things are, are going to be something that I'm really proud of and excited for people to see. And of course, if anyone's watched Decoders of Truth, that's that season one dropped on Billy's network as well. And that's had some pretty good feedback. But this the new show, Mystery School of Truth, has had a lot a lot of um, quite a bit of effort put into it for graphics and designs. And it's quite a high level project that he's put money and work into. So I will also have a trailer for that. Uh, a brand new trailer that's going to be coming out that I'll put up on my channel. So there's a um, a lot coming in September. It, September to October is going to be um, really exciting for things coming up. Now, I want to just, before you we talk about um, a little bit about the book project, I want to mention one more thing. A another announcement that I think um, people have been saying, like, oh, you've been kind of quiet. Like, what's been going on? There's been a lot going on. And I, there's a <laughs> lot of things that people are going to be excited about that I haven't done yet. And the big the big announcement that um, I can I can make is that I will be at my first conference. So a lot of people have emailed me and messaged me when I'm going to do a conference, when they can come meet me, when they can come see me in person. And so I will be at the Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles, February 10th. I'll be speaking. I have a four o'clock slot for my own, my own workshop. And then I'll be on the um, panel discussion that Jimmy Jimmy Church hosts for um, ancient ancient the ancient um, conference or uh, the ancient panel that he hosts uh, at like five thirty. So if people, you know, you got to. There's only a certain, certain amount of tickets. I think there's like 150 people that can that can be in that room. So if you really would like to see me and meet me and and go to a conference that I do, I'll be doing a whole slideshow and a presentation there. And so get your tickets because when they sell out, that's it. So they're um they're already on sale, and so I highly encourage people to to start getting ready for that because that'll be February. So anyway, that was a long-winded set of mm -hmm. announcements, but there's no, been right. a lot a lot going on. Well, I'm exhausted just hearing you explain all that, man. But I'm I'm always I'm so so very excited for you and just and and just stoked, man. You you've been really like you said putting your heart and soul into the, into your work, and it is so so very compelling. And it goes to some of the root questions of who are we, where we came from. And once you delve into this, you realize how much we have to unlearn because there's been so much concerted effort to keep us from understanding the truth of where we came from. And it is so, so very fascinating. And uh, again, man, congratulations on all your success, bro. Thank you. And, you know, you're going to continue to keep killing it. And, you know, we're going to technically kind of bounce around a little bit here today. But at the end of the day, the moral of all of this information we're going to be talking about is like Matthew said, things are way older than what we're told. And, you know, we have some had some skills that have been long since forgotten. And, you know, going back into ancient antiquity, there are a lot of answers to, like I said, who are we, where we came from. And so I think it's important, <clears throat> excuse me, to start out with Eridu. And we've talked about, you know, Matthew on other, and like I said, on other programs I've been on with him or he's been on, you know, the Conspiracy Forum. We've talked about Eridu and the significance of Eridu of being basically the first city, the first pre-Diluvian city. When I talk about pre-Diluvian, like pre-flood city on Earth. Matthew, what is the significance? And I know you're very passionate about it, especially when we see the state Eridu is in now. Talk about the significance of Eridu. And, um, and like I said, what's going on with it now? Yeah, and I've talked about this in some shows, so I won't be as in-depth as I've been before just because sure. I don't want to have people hear the same thing over and over again. But I do have some new things to share regarding Eridu, and I can give some updates and give a little people, people a little bit of an understanding of why that's so significant. So back um, over six months ago, I started a campaign to protect Eridu because it's one of these places that has slipped through the cracks, you know. Academia is ignoring this location. You can go into a lot of reasons on why that's the case. But if you want to try to understand it, you have to look at the significance of what the ancient Sumerians, um, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, what they discussed in their ancient tablets, the tablets that predate any known form of writing on the on the earth. So if we were to try to understand what the oldest story that's been recorded to try to understand our past, yeah, some people like to lean on channeling and they lean on these different various methods. I like to lean on evidence. I like to lean on what I can 
put my hands on and read and learn and try to understand this story. And of course, it's one of those aspects where you don't just take a tablet and then make that the the Bible of your thought process. We sure. what we have um, what we have available to us that gives me so much confidence in what I do is the massive wealth of cuneiform tablets that have come out of the Fertile Crescent region of what's today known as Iraq. That region has um, has supplied over 30,000 of these cuneiform tablets. And so when, what happens is that when we take this handful of tablets and then we're able to find information on them that correlates with others, and some of these are from completely different time periods. That's what one of the misconceptions about these tablets is that they're all from the same civilization. But often what you get is a carrying down of information from one civilization to another. But when you see the correlation in that data and evidence is, is almost identical, it gives you more authenticity to not think that the story was changed over time. Because of course, that's the the phone game, as you would call it. Yeah. As when you tell a story and then it changes it over time. That's one of the biggest considerations in all of this to worry that a story becomes um, altered over time and it's no longer in its pure form. But the wild thing is that when you read, for instance, you read the Atrahasis, the the original Sumerian account from this figure, Zaya Sudra Untupishtim, on these events of human origin creation and the events of the Great Deluge before the before the Younger Dryas, that story is then carried on by the Babylonians in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Right. So we have almost the exact same story, literally like not word for word, but the information they present is identical. And we can take these correlations from all these tablets and put them together. And that provides us with this avenue to basically recreate the story of our past. And I, I guess the first place to mention to people listening to this, if they don't know, is that you have to completely reject this date we're told on how old these tablets are. That's the right. first thing. And even more significantly, we have to reject um, how old the stories are. I think that's the strongest place of the message to get across is that what we're talking about are stories that are so old that they're beyond our comprehension of an age. Let me give you an example. Our civilization today, you know, arriving, uh, coming out of things like nomadic hunter gathering to ancient civilizations that get wiped out, right? They reach this heightened stage of being wiped out. And then we have to start over again, which is what the story is basically. And then we rise up again and over again. But over time, we've lost so much of our knowledge of the cosmos and energy and consciousness and about the things that we don't really consider as important today as we as they used to. You know, we're focused very much on materialism and this um, this other identity of our reality. But they didn't feel that way. And so look at our civilization now. Our civilization is 500 years old, you could call it, right? Some would argue, I'm talking like when it rose up, when it become more sophisticated, out of the Middle Ages, where we became... Um, where we <laughs> things like um, inventing like toilet paper and like getting it's a, they're developing in a civilization that's more organized. We're talking about that's a 500 year story. Look where we are right now. Now imagine a story that goes back 12, 15, 20, 50,000 years. It's it's almost beyond our capability to grasp how far back that was. And so when people talk about whether or not it's Eridu and the dates that it's given for when that was created or things like Atlantis, which it's amazing to me that people don't realize how significant the evidence is for that. And that was destroyed. Plato gives us descriptions of when it was destroyed, <clears throat> it destroyed 11,600 years ago. So what we're talking about here is an ancient, ancient story. Now, how does that relate to Eridu? Well, in all these tablets, um, Austin Henry Laird, you know, 1800s, discovers these massive libraries that have accumulated um, these these records of our past from past uh, priests and kings who have recognized how important they are. The Library of Ashurbanipal, correct? Yeah, the Library of Ashurbanipal is the most famous of these discoveries. And nearby in Nippur, there's been other um, smaller libraries that have been found. But 
the first thing that I think is mind blowing to consider is for people who don't know, Sumerian is considered a dead language, meaning when it was discovered, it hadn't been spoken for over a thousand years, spoken or written about. So we're we're talking about a language that doesn't share characteristics or commonalities with any of the languages we speak today. And so once that got translated, they found out, oh my God, we had this enormous um this enormous amount of information that tells these stories that later became the biblical stories we know today. Of course, they were yeah. altered in their states. They're not what they used to be, right. but they all came from all, like literally all of them. Every story we see, whether it's a great flood or flood or some kind of an idea of um, ancient kings and giants and all these things, it all came from the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Akkadians. That's where it came from. And what they say in six tablets, I think I've determined at this point, six completely different tablets, is that the first city ever created was known as Eridu. Every single one of them says that. And it's, it's so it's something where you look at, you're like, wait a minute. So there's these five cities that are mentioned every time, whether or not it's, it's Babylonian or Sumerian or Akkadian. They all say, they talk about it, you know, Sumerian kingless, Eridu, Genesis, Uruk, list of kings and sages, um, Atrahasis, Epic of Gilgamesh. They all talk about the same things. They mention that these, there are these original cities created, and of course the age of those is where it gets into a, a great debate, but they that they're clearly older than the Younger Dryas, clearly older than 12,000 mm. years ago because they talk about this great event that occurred, which we're going to get into um, today. And, well, but that's they the all first line of the Sumerian kings list, right? When kingship was right. lord from heaven, kingship was in Eridu. That, and it's the first line on many other tablets as well. For instance, Eridu Genesis, where we're talking about, they say the same, uh, almost the exact same thing. When king kingship had descended from heaven, um, the first of the cities, Eridu, was given to Nunamud, the leader. And Nunamud was the, the physical incarnation of Enki in one of those lifetimes. And so it's one, it's confusing because you have to follow all of these names and these descriptions to try to figure out this like ancient story that existed. But yeah, Eridu is mentioned consistently, and that's the point I want people to understand, consistently mentioned, not one place differs from that, and, and not one tablet differs, is that it's the first city ever created on Earth, not something where a nomadic hunter gathers just got together and like they randomly decided to create something. Right. That's not at all what they say. In fact, it was a, it was a specific location chosen for the first city on Earth that is described as being a pure place. That's what they say in every tablet about when they talk about this. They say lay these lay the bricks of this city to the Ajiji who are building it in this pure location of energy on the Earth, and um, that opens up a lot of other doors for what that means and the significance of the, of the star alignments and how everything on Earth from these civilizations seems to mirror the cosmos. So um, what we are going to do is try to continue to recreate this story, Jeffrey, because the story is com very different than what we're told in school. And so very, very. you and I, uh, we got started on Eridu, didn't we? <clears throat> for sure what's interesting like you said the, the rehab the, the modern day tales whether it's the Unumilish, the Atrahasis, you know epic of gilgamesh if you don't mind i mean the one i always i mean they're all interesting but as it relates to eridu uh the myth of adapa adapa being uh one of the kings of eridu and the myth of adapa is essentially i mean if you read it it's just mind-blowing how it's literally the garden of eden story it is and one of the things that's so significant about a myth of adapa is it's the tablet that or one of the tablets that strongly dis it discusses in a way where it says, look, you humans, I'm just paraphrasing, basically you humans were created in perfection here. It, it actually says that the first perfect created human, and that's the strong emphasis to get across in these tablets, is that we did not come out of just randomness of evolutionist states. It says that we were actually created by these gods. These are Nuna gods, they call them. And they state that Eridu was the city then also created in the specific location. And that's where this Adapa figure was um, was living. He was living there, and he's considered one of the one of the seven sages. They were called the Apkalu. And there were these seven sages 
that were supposed to be incredibly wise that would that traveled all around the region in some cases maybe even the world and created civilizations along with a great teacher there's always this other great teacher that goes with them but the the seven sages are like these craftsmen these 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 great priests um these great deep thinkers that have all this incredible knowledge and this high level of thinking and they're like these architects of these entire civilizations and so the myth of adapa what it says in there that's so profound is that it says that adapa not only is the perfect man but he's the greatest among the anunnaki which is so compelling to think about because there are creators so by saying that he's the greatest among them He's basically, it's basically saying that we are them or they are us mm. and that, and that he's the most perfect of all of those, in fact, greater than them. And that's the thing where, when you start looking into the great deluge stories and how we were potentially deliberately, the seed of mankind was being deliberately um, decided to be wiped out by some to, to, to extinguish us from here. I think it really stems from this idea that we became um, more powerful than our creators and that mm. we also had been intermingled with the bloodlines of these gods and were living for these incredibly long reigns, which is one of the things that you know, Jeffrey. Yes, the Sumerian Kings list. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing because it's it, within the Sumerian Kings list, it said something about you know the, the time of all of the kingship ruled for, I think it was no less than 240, like 200 plus thousand years that you know this was obviously before the flood. But I, I found that so very fascinating. And I listened to you. You were on. You were in Randall Carlson had a conversation, which was just absolutely mind blowing. I just realized how I, you guys, you know, it was just crazy listening to you guys because those, the, you guys' mind coming together was something I've always wanted to see. I've had a chance to talk to Randall myself, but you know, it's anyway. Something you guys mentioned. I mean, obviously, the ancients put a huge emphasis on like celestial cycles and star cycles of the stars, the sun, etc. And um, it seems like the the coincidence to talk. I'm sorry. Clarify if you will, because Randall said something about some of these, um, well, the, the dates of the Sumerian kings list and some of the reigns corresponded corresponded with certain Hein Heinrich events. And just to, to define what a Heinrich event is, it's a natural uh, natural phenomenon in which a large groups of icebergs break off from glaciers and traverse the North Atlantic. First described by a marine geologist. Harm at Heinrich. They occurred during five of the last seven glacial periods over the last 640,000 years. And he had mentioned something about um, the dates, the, the cycles were, again, going back to how they paid so much of attention to this, the cycles of the stars and the sun, particularly the Vedas, that's where a lot of these numbers come from. It's a cycle of like 26,000 years or 12,900 years. It was a certain... There was a certain cycle of these yeah. of these events happening, and he had said something about those dates and those numbers corresponded with the dates from the Sumerian kings list. What did that mean exactly? If I explain well, that right. Okay, so the Heinrich, yeah. So I'm gonna give a little more, a little more detail on what the Heinrich events mean. It's a really cool way to date Earth history. So when we look at Earth history, we can't, you can't date rock. So it's difficult. For, you can't take, go to like a a megalithic structure, a pyramid, and be able to date it because the only way you can date that kind of there's there's basically organic dating through radiocarbon dating, and then there's there's potentially you can lose. We're starting to get into the technology of dating rock if in the future if we can figure out by its uh, composition of of breaking down things like certain elements within that. It, it's something we're going to be getting into, but right now we can't really accurately date rock. In the future, maybe we can get a little bit better of our about our dating. So it leaves just a couple ways to date. If we don't have organic matter that's been perfectly preserved, and that's what you have to have, like Gobekli Tepe was buried so that the organic matter is more accurate to measure because of that. But in most cases, we have to measure either using ice core samples to get an understanding of, of Earth Earth events, not structures. But if we were to like try to think about these different time periods that occurred on the Earth with violent catastrophes, which you know corresponding to what we're saying with the Heinrich events, we can either use ice cores taken from like Greenland or even Antarctica to look at CO2 accumulation and oxygen and different things in that to tell the atmosphere. Or there's one more way, and that's called these Heinrich events. And this is something that's relatively new in terms of we're not using it on that level really yet, but it's something that we'll probably use more in the future. And Randallson really nailed that that date on the head because 
he pointed out, well, look, what you know, what is a Heinrich event? And he explained it. And what it is is when you get glaciation on a consistent basis on the Earth, which I believe it happens on a consistent cyclical basis, and we can talk about the reasons why I think that happened. But when you have that on a consistent basis, you then have a situation where it looks like these ice ages, these gla- these interglaciated periods seem to end really rapidly every time. They form slowly, but they end very rapidly. They seem to end in this cycle of catastrophes on the Earth with extreme warming mm. that occurs. So imagine a gigantic continental glacier uh, ice sheet, like the Laurentide ice sheet in North America. It makes it, it, it grows over time in nor- northern, far northern Canada. And as it accumulates more ice and snow, it moves its way south like a giant, slow moving wave of ice, right? It moves its way slowly and it accumulates and builds as it over time. And as it, as it moves, it is so heavy. I mean, baffling to be on our understanding, our comprehension of how, how gigantic these ice caps were one to two miles in height. This huge mass of ice that literally is so big, it can push down the entire um, crust of the earth and, sum- and, and subdue it down below. And it's kind of funny because when they retreat, the, the land actually sort of bounces back almost a little bit over time. It rises back up because it had so much pressure. But what they do is when they're moving south, they grab all kinds of gravel and, and sediment as they gouge their way through the earth and move south. And on the front end of every of these gigantic glaci- glaciers, they have all this debris that when it's deposited, it's called a moraine. That's what Long Island is. Long Island, the, the if you look at it on a map, that's just the giant glacial moraine where the glaciers stopped and then receded and they left wow. like, almost like, a, like a plow. If a plow is pushing up all this material in front of it and then you stop and back up, you get this big pile of stuff in front of you. That's what all what Long Island is. It's a gigantic glacial moraine from where the last ice age, the ice caps made their way as far south. And then before they retreated, they left all that debris. Well, there's another thing that happens that gives us a way to measure when these events occurred. Because like I said, most of these, these, these glaciation periods tend to end rapidly. Like they don't, something happens and it's so warm that things happen very quickly and you get massive deluges of water and you get, um, you get other things as well, like you get calving off of the glaciers into the ocean. So as the glaciers move down in, across the land, they also end up moving out into the ocean. But the ice has all that material stuck in it. All that gravel and all that moraine material is stuck in the ice. So as they move further and further out in the ocean during these glacial periods, then all of a sudden you get this rapid warming and they they start calving off into the ocean in the North Atlantic. So these glaciers start calving off and they sink down and all the material flows to the bottom of the ocean. And so... Now what you get are these layers of sediment on the ocean floor that had this distinctive gravel mixed in that you can then tell, well, look, this is when these glaciers calved off. And Mm -hmm. so you can take those, the soil and you're able to, to take that and do an analysis on it, the sediment on the bottom of the ocean, and you can actually get dates for when these events occurred, when they, these giant glaciers would calve off into the ocean and then deposit a layer. So when we do that, like you said, we get this this age of like looking at the last 600,000 years of Earth history. And when you combine it with ice cores from Antarctica, because we can't get ice cores that old in Greenland, that, that ice cap's not that old. But Antarctica's mm. ice sheet is over a million years old. And so the Vostok Glacier, we, we have a chance to take ice cores there that we can get data for over 200,000 years ago. Now, regardless of if that dating is perfectly accurate, it still gives us a snapshot to say, look, these glacial periods on Earth, they happen at these intervals with these great catastrophes that seem to end them over and over again. It's a cycle. And the cycle seems to be the reason why, and that's a long-winded way to answer your question, but the cycle seemed to be this very significant moment in Earth history when these civilizations would be disrupted. But not only that, these civilizations may have based a lot of their um, their ages. So if we if they were able, like for instance, they were able to identify that these events occurred, let's say every thirteen thousand years, 
um, and in some cases, then maybe maybe some of those dates, maybe there's another interval that goes to like ninety thousand or something. But there's like these different intervals when they happen. But they can they then relate that to the zodiac and looking at the ages that are moving between every two thousand one hundred years between these ages of the zodiac. So they basically the reason why I think the Sumerian king list is mimicking that is I think that they're basing all of their civilizations on cycles. Mm-hmm. And when different kings would rule, it doesn't mean they necessarily <clears throat> died either. I think because if you read it, it says kingship was descended and went here, and then kingship was here, and then it was in this city, and then it was eventually in Sharupak, and then the, the great deluge came through, destroyed everything, and then Atana becomes the king of Kish, and it's this great new, new cycle over again. What are they talking about? Mm. Why would kingship have to move between different cities? Well, the thing that I've identified is it seems like we had this almost like if you had, um, for instance, look at our world today. There are these centers of centers of power that for governing everything, right? Like Washington, D.C. is this center of power, this independent state that's kind of strange in its own way with obelisks everywhere, right? And all these hmm. ancient stuff that's mixed in from, from the, the Freemasons and the founding fathers. But it's like you have these capitals of where everything gets determined, where it's got some connection to like the highest levels of government and power. And it seems like that's what kingship was. It was this highest level, and they would move it between different places based on different ages. And so that's why it's so interesting. But Eridu is the first city not only created, but the first place that kingship was descended on Earth. So, so fascinating, man. I can't even get my mind around how huge these glaciers were to be, glaciers were to be scraping the bottom of the ocean. That's just amazing to me. Yeah, well, we got to remember back during the before the Younger Dryas, before twelve thousand years ago, ocean levels were four hundred feet lower than they are than they are today. So we're talking about an environment and a world that was very different than it is. And if you look at, if you go on, for instance, you look at either Bathymetric or charts or just Google Google Maps and look at imagery off of the east coast of North America, you can still see where the edge of North America was. You could see where it goes all it goes out very shallow. It's it's part of the um, part of the the edge of the the continent that sticks out underwater and then you can see what's very interesting that I've talked about before there's these gigantic outflows that you can see like rivers cutting through the edge of where the old continent the, the continent basically stuck out and that those outflows are from these younger the younger dryas event we're talking about outflows of water so significant they carved gorges on the edge of where the continent dropped off in the ocean that are deeper than the Grand Canyon in some cases. These are massive events that are almost beyond our comprehension because it's so deep that we haven't even really gone down to explore them in most cases. In fact, only between 5 and 10% of the entire ocean floor has been explored today. And wow. it's, it's mind-blowing because there's so much of our history that's down there. But it's showing us, what it's telling us is that this event of just the last event, the Younger Dryas event uh, between between 11,000 and 13,000 years ago, was so significant, so severe, that it led to this drastic end of the last ice age. Massive disruptions in ocean currents, which is a hmm. huge, huge deal for, the, deal for the climate of the Earth, as well as um, having events on the Earth that were so severe that they caused... Um, glass and vitrification to form on these rocks and objects that ha- meaning that the temperature on the earth exceeded 2000 degrees in some places. Yeah. And <clears throat> excuse me, Randall talked about that. Um, I think it's the scab lands up there in the Northwest where a very similar thing happened, where something happened so immediate and the, the, the force of the water and the, the immediate uh, melting of everything was just so severe. Um, he talked about what they're called erratics big building sized boulders that yes. were maybe indigenous to a certain area, but they were miles and miles Lasted, where they, sh- right? where they shouldn't have been. Or yeah. going back to dating these events, he talked about the black mat that was basically ash that you could find that you could literally date when that ash was deposited because at this point, everything, this huge cataclysm happened. And to that, 
what, if you were to speculate, what is – these guys were obviously able to – the ancients, I mean, were able to map these events and kind of almost predict the cycles of these things. What, do you, what, what causes this? What causes these huge cataclysmic events in your opinion? Well, the first thing I want to clarify is um, – and this is something I've been work, working on for some future projects at Gaia. Stay tuned that we're going to try to recreate the timeline of our, of our history. But um, when you try to look at what the evidence is for what caused these – that whole conversation with Randall Carlson, you can find on my channel if you haven't seen it. That whole conversation was based on us uh, in an academic way debating our personal opinions based on research for what caused the Younger Dryas catastrophe. and But moreover, what was causing this cycle, this cycle to occur on a, on a, on a basis of around 13,000 years. Like now, clockwork almost. It is. And... The, the first thing to point out is that I want people to wrap their minds around something, though. Try to imagine magnitudes of, of, of Earth changes so significant that anything that's happened in modern human history is basically like nothing. Not even something – volcanoes going off, uh, tsunamis around the world that hundreds of thousands of people died. That's terrible. That's significant in our time. That's nothing like we can even put into words right. to describe the Younger Dryas catastrophes. Imagine, if you will, catastrophes that are occurring over th these different uh, – It's because it's not all at once. Imagine a cycle that comes in, and the cycle of catastrophes on the Earth in intervals happens over a 1,200-year time, meaning that when they start happening on the planet – they happen periodically for 1,200 years. And if you were a civilization, okay, remember our whole story is like 500 to 1,000 years old mostly. You could call it a couple thousand years at most. If, I mean, it depends on what you want to define our civilization. Right, right. That, that story, though, um, imagine a civilization trying to survive 1,200 years during these events. I mean, that, think about how long that is, right? Oh, in, you know, how, think about 100 years. Imagine you're a civilization that's got s cities all around the world, sophistication, you have maritime empires, you have, you have all kinds of these structures set up where they're recording data and information. They're, they're all, they have all these things in place. And imagine just a couple events in like 100 years, you know, like a tsunami that's multiple miles high sw swinging through and like wiping everything out. And then... And then climatic changes where extreme <clears throat> droughts are occurring and then almost like global fires setting off around the world. And imagine things like massive volcanism around the planet and which altering the climate and then imagine gigantic tectonic shifts. Now, when I mean te tectonic shifts, one of the areas that I'm going to be going into great detail in the new book with Billy Carson called The Epic of Humanity, which is coming soon, guys. Mm -hmm. Coming soon in maybe the next month. And I spent two years writing that book. Now, one of the things I extensively discuss that is baffling is look at the descriptions left behind from Plato. They describe it as Atlantis sinking in and just disappearing into the sea. Not, not, we're not talking about oceans just rising up. We're talking about a landmass disappearing. Just imagine what would have to happen for an entire landmass to literally disappear, like sink. Now, to do that, it's called plate subduction, okay? Now, so the area that I'm going to be talking about extensively in the book besides Atlantis is tying in this sunken city, this, these incredible ruins that were found in um, only like less than 10 years ago off of Cuba, off the western tip of Cuba. They've, they've sonar mapped out these ruins that looks like they're a you know mixture of ancient Mayan and, Egy and Egyptian design, which is basically like a cross between the Atlantean Empire, between those two locations. But um, these ruins that are absolutely mind-blowing, compelling, so much data for, their, for, the, for them being genuine that the head of National Geographic was going to go, was going to going, went down. They were going to be involved in doing these entire missions down using um, robotics, underwater robotics to go down and see these. And the whole project just poof disappeared. And so I'm going to be going into a lot of detail on that in the book. But the point of that is 
what baffled them the most about these ruins, which in my mind are 100% true, you have sonar recreation of these structures that are in this giant undulating sand plain that goes miles and miles and mi miles with no rock structures and nothing. And then there's, there's just this city that's like 11 miles by like 11 miles. It's, this thing is huge. I mean, we're talking about a massive, massive set of ruins, okay? What most baffled them about those was not in the, mo in the, the, big, in the way that's most significant. It wasn't necessarily just that they existed. It was that they were 2,000 feet underwater, okay? Mm. Try to wrap your head around that for a minute, Jeffrey. Yeah. So ocean levels rose up 400 feet, 400 feet. We're not talking about something 400 <clears throat> feet underwater. We're talking about something 2,000 feet underwater. Now, that's crazy. in order to do that, you would have to have such massive changes on the Earth through tectonic changes, which I think would come from a massive axis, axis pole shift, which would basically destabilize all the tectonic plates on the Earth. And I do think there's, there's evidence to support crustal displacement because of that, where you would have some continents in some parts of the land that literally start moving in and you get massive earthquakes which is why if you were to have earthquakes try to imagine like the 2004 tsunami killed 200,000 people on the earth terrible now imagine an earthquake instead of being like a nine point something imagine like a 13 or 14 magnitude earthquake Imagine a, imagine a set of tsunamis that go around the world and these tsunamis are like five miles high. And they go around the world and they literally destroy everything. That's why even civilizations like Machu Picchu and Tiwanaku and Pumapunku that are found over 10,000 feet up were basically wiped out. Now, so what does that mean for plate subduction? Those plates... Like Atlantis, the reason why, and you can still see it today. Go look at the area that's near the Azor Islands. You have three plates coming together in one location along the Mediterranean, the Mid Atlantic Ridge. It's exactly where the descriptions of, of Atlantis was supposed to be. And now I'm not, I'm not saying that Mauritania, Africa doesn't have something, have some influences because it's described as the kings of Atlas being there. Fine. There's probably some connections to that area of, of Africa being in, in, included, but I don't think that's the, the central city. I think the main part of the civilization Atlantis was where it was described, which is west of Gibraltar out in the ocean, which is why it's described as sinking in the sea. But that those plates subducted. That's how Atlantis was destroyed. It's subducted under the ocean. Mm. It's exactly what we see off of Cuba. This subduction of a plate that sent it down 2,000 feet. So try to imagine that those kinds of changes would be why you could get a civilization that was in some cases more sophisticated than we were in some ways, would be literally wiped out. And the, and only a few survivors would come along. Like at Machu Picchu, we find, we see, one of the only places on Earth, actually, that we see this attempt to rebuild. And there's a shallow layer of, of megaliths that are similar in, in composition and, and complexity, but there's, there's, it's, a, it's like a narrow area. It's shorter than the ones below it, and then it's gone. And then it's primitive above it. So there's evidence that the survivors tried to rebuild. But then and then something else happened because there was events that occurred at the beginning of the Younger Dryas and then there's events that occurred at the end of it because we're talking mm. about, you know, between the 1200 and 2000 year interval cycle right. of these events. And so when that second set of events occurred, which I think was a tsunami to end the whole thing, um, the remnants of whatever was left of them was basically gone in the, for, in the most cases. Imagine that an entire... Right. Epic of our story that was wiped out, and now most 90 95 percent of humanity thinks that it was that it was not real and it was just a myth. Yeah, well, and going back to what you said, you know, about Plato talking about it just disappearing, I think he wrote about that. And it's his mentor, I think, Solon in uh, the Timaeus and Critias, I think it's called. So, if you get, people want to go check that out, that's an actual book that that was written by Plato. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard, not to digress too much, I've been hearing recently that Jacques Cousteau was very fascinated about this area off of Cuba, and he kind of on the low was doing his own search for Atlantis. I don't know if you heard about that. I haven't looked a great deal into that, but I would definitely check it out. But the indigenous stories from the Maya talk about an island landmass that existed off of the main part of the Yucatan that was where their ancestors lived 
they they talk about it. It's in the it's in the traditions of Atlantis. And one of the interesting things that brings correlation to that is, so people think that Atlantis was a myth because they say that it, that Plato made up the story as an example to describe the per, a perfect civilization versus a corrupted one. But they don't do the research to find out where that story came from. That's the thing that aggravates me the most. Are Atlantean deniers, you could call them. Mm. They say that he made that up, and they don't even they don't look into at all where he got the story. And where he got the story is the most important thing. Is that it's not only him. It was Solon and um, another Greek philosopher named Diodorus also um, became aware of the same story. Because Solon traveled to Egypt to a, a temple called the Temple Temple of Sais, S A I S, and it is a fascinating story because he met these he met these temple priests, and of course that temple was destroyed after he visited it, which gets, brings up a whole other set of questions about if that was found out that it was the only place left, and that's how the, that's how the temple priests describe it. Besides the Temple of Seti, that may have um, higher. Uh, Hieroglyphs that show what may be advanced technology from Atlantis, there's pretty much nowhere else that shows anything from an ancient site like that. And so the temple priests mm. of uh, safe, the safe, say that they were the keepers of the Atlantean civilization story and that they had in their walls, which is actually very rare now for these ancient temples back then, because like the Great Pyramid of Giza and the other Great Pyramids have no writing inside at all. So th this was a rare situation, but this temple, they described, these priests described it to Solon that they had the entire story of Atlantis written into the walls of the temple and that they were the temple keepers of that story. And they told him that you Greeks are aware of one catastrophe, but there have been many over the course of human civilizations where civilizations have risen and fallen before even the time of Atlantis. And this wow. is where it gets into the ancient Sumerian stuff because I believe that those tablets, there's too many correlations with the, the Sumerian king list and the Uruk list of kings and sages and the Barocious king list from Babylon and others that describe these cities as being the first ever created. Meaning if they were, they wouldn't say that if Atlantis had already existed. I believe that the original Sumerian story that has been carried down by other civilizations since, the Fertile Crescent has had more civilizations continuously throughout history, the part of Iraq than anywhere else in the world. So, of course, they carried them down. Mm -hmm. But I believe that original civilization in Eridu <clears throat> may be 200,000 years old. And, wow. and so what we're talking about is I think Atlantis and Lemuria Mu was this um, perfection of what came out of those civilizations, which is why it became so significant because it was like the great bloodline kings from the Sumerians and all those groups that where it talks about the giants living for these extended reigns, right? And some think that's not real. Go read Plato and Diodorus' description of Atlantis. They go into detail in the Timaeus and Critias of saying that the kings of Atlas, of Atlantis, were giants— the literal giants, these tall, huge beings, which we know that what that was, it was a mixture of the gods who were supposed to be, these Anuna gods who were supposed to be very, very tall that mixed their bloodlines with humans. And they have, that's, they had this like, this hybrid bloodline. Then not only were they tall, but they lived for like thousands of years in some cases, which is mm. totally beyond our comprehension today. But in the Timius and Critias, this is why we need to not reject the dating and the of the Sumerian king list, the Uruk list of kings and sages, and the Barocious list, king list, that all agree exactly on their dates, right? Because it, Plato says from Solon and Diodorus says from the story the temple priest of Sais told them that Atlantis was ruled by demigods, a half god, half humans from these sons of Atlas, and the original, you know who the original father of them was. Atlantis, the original founder and the father where Atla, the sons of Atlas came from, was Poseidon. Poseidon was Enki. Mm -hmm. Because you can find the exact descriptions of, <clears throat> of his um, the trident and the, and the symbolism with, with Poseidon, what his mentality was, to the Sumerian god Enki. So it means that he, they created these cities in the ancient um, the Fertile Crescent region and eventually created like, like a super civilization. 
Now, here's where it gets kind of wild. And this is something that doesn't get talked about, Jeffrey, and I don't know why. But it's something that I'm spearheading and I talk about in the book, and I've been doing a lot of work at Gaia for, is that there's something in the Timaeus and Critias that is so fundamentally important that I don't know why it doesn't get more credibility and discussion. He says in there that there was two civilizations created at the same time that were competing in dominance because they were controlled by different gods. Now, this mm. god, these, these, this battle, this war, was known as um, the Titans versus the Olympians. Mm. Okay. Now, if you look into that, the Titans versus the Olympians, the Titans were supposed to be the older generation gods, and the Olympians were the younger generation gods. Now, Mount Olympus, their god was Zeus. Okay. Now, in, in the Titans... There, the the founder of that was was um, was Poseidon, who think about this for a minute. You remember all my work we do with the with the eagle versus the serpent. Mm. We're talking about these Anuna gods that seem to be competing for dominance with civilizations, where they were influencing them to rise up, and they would be they would compete against each other. Now, so I think based on all of the research of this, that it seems as if. Um, Poseidon was just was Enki creating the Atlantean civilization. Now there's another civilization that existed. They say in the Timaeus and Critias discusses how there was an ancient war going on, which I believe was the Titans versus the Olympians. And he describes the war as being fought with the Atlanteans versus the Athenians. Have you heard about this yet? No. It's right in there. It's right in the doc in his in the Timaeus and Critias. That there was another rival civilization in the Mediterranean, in ancient in in where ancient Greece is called the Athenians. This would make so much sense how the Greeks had so much knowledge and so much information because they were the progenitors. They came after a previous civilization that existed there. Mm -hmm. Now today, we find megalithic evidence around Athens in in the area of Greece, that there is more sophisticated megalithic construction on the lowermost levels, just like we find around the world, but it really doesn't get talked about. And it's kind of odd to me, but what we're looking at is before the classical Greeks, thousands and thousands of years before the classical Greeks existed, there was another civilization, another maritime empire, and they were ruled by Zeus. And that was the, that this was the Olympians. The Athenians, they were called the Athenians in the Plato's description. I think they were also called the Olympians, if you take the war of the Titans versus the Olympians. And, and Zeus, Zeus was basically Enlil, Enlil, correct? Zeus was Enlil, and um, Prometheus or Poseidon was Enki. And they were competing for these master civilizations, these mm. incredibly sophisticated global empires that competed for dominance. I think Atlantis was older. I think Atlantis was quite a bit older than the ancient Athenians. I think the Athenian Empire was created after by Zeus, and then they went to war and they 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 fought over um, territory with each other. But either way, where everyone talks about Atlantis and Lemuria, Lemuria Mu, Mu, which is a totally different s subject story that's not really related. It's it's a separate thing, but. We're talking about two maritime empire civilizations that were went to war. So Plato describes how they were literally at, at a, in a massive war against each other. And the only reason that the Athenians won was that Atlantis ended up being destroyed by the events of the Younger Dryas. We know that because Plato says that Atlantis sank in the sea. Um, he describes it as 9,000 years before him. And, and he was around about 2,000 years ago. So you get this date of 11,600 years, which exactly matches the ice core samples and the Heinrich, Heinrich events yeah. for the Younger Dryas catastrophes. It all lines up. It's impossible wow. that that could be based on just um, an analogy to talk about civilizations. Yeah, that's that's too heavy of a coincidence. And again, going back to what you were saying, it's interesting that to see how these ancient deities were represented throughout other myths. Like you said, you know, Enki was uh, was Poseidon, was Neptune, was Odin. Like these guys reappear throughout different mythology in yeah. history. It's very fascinating. 
Um, in, in your conversation with Randall, and this obviously isn't to freak people out, but I think you mentioned something about as it relates to the timetable of these these cataclysmic cycles yeah, okay. that we yeah. that that we are long overdue, if you will, for another one, or overdue, we're about due for another one. Yeah, and during that conversation with Randall, the big point of our our descriptive, I don't know, hypothesis discussion when we were looking at what we how what we feel caused those events. Um, Randall, his primary thesis is is based around this idea of impacts, cosmic impacts that came in, and you know Graham Hancock and him work they work closely together, and that's one of these the primary, I guess you could call it primary theory, with a lot of these alternative researches, which I hate that we have to call ourselves that, but it's it's the label we have to use, <laughs> is that there were. Um, there, there's a disruption to like the Kuiper belt or the torrid meteor shower comes through on this cyclical basis every 13,000 years. And there are comets or meteorite fragments that like literally hit the earth and cause all these events. Now, my problem with that, and I'm not saying that's never happened or doesn't happen. Absolutely. Problem I have with that is that I have never seen evidence of an, an impact crater on the earth. And I would love if someone could send me data on that. But I have never found evidence of any impact craters on the Earth that are younger than 13,000 years ago or 13,000 years old. And that's the problem is that that's a great theory to have to help explain these extreme temperature fluctuations and these Earth changes. But where are the impacts? Um, and that's one of the issues. And there was news that came out about, well, there's and there was an impact crater discovered in Greenland. Well, we know that ice cap is over 20,000 years old, so that can't work. If if that happens, it's if that if that impact crater is below the ice in Greenland, it means it's older than twenty thousand years old. So I started getting deeply involved in Robert Schock's work. I think Robert Schock is another one of these great researchers. He's a geologist. He's a trained geologist, and he said, "No, no, no. Look, notice how many times the ancient people describe these like plasma events in the sky. These plasma events. Okay, and I'll tell you what they're basically like electrical discharge events." And you would get that from a specific type of event. He says, look at this and then look at vitrification we're seeing on structures around the world. Vitrification means melting of the rock, something like exceeding thousands of degrees, right? Look around the world at these events. Look at how it seems that the poles shifted. For instance, most ancient sites around the world um, that are built before the Younger Dryas are 23 and a half degrees off true north or magnetic north, okay? So what that means is that there was a global event that shifted the axis of the entire Earth during the Younger Dryas 23 and a half degrees. And so what could have caused that? Well, I very much believe, and I, I've seen very, very compelling data on this from so many places. I'll give, I'll give one more example really quick before I go deeper into that. There was a study that a lot of people don't know uh, in the Sahara Desert that was done a number of years ago by a number of scientists who figured out that the highest concentration of um, desert glass in the world is in the Sahara Desert. Libya, the area around Libya towards Egypt, has the highest concentration of desert glass in the world. And it's famous because uh, ancient pharaohs have gone out and found desert glass and have used it in some of their knives and different things like that. But when they went out there, they recognized that it was the highest concentration of desert glass. So they figured that it would be the number one location where you could find impact craters. And they thought, well, because the Sahara Desert, the sand dunes move so consistently, they thought that those impact craters would be under the sand. And so they could find remnants and signatures of those impact craters out there. They did an extensive study with multiple people, uh, credible academics that tried to find those impacts. They were not they were not able to find any impacts in the Sahara Desert anywhere at all. And it led them confusion because their only hypothesis to, to counter that was that instead of impacts, it had to be from an extreme solar event. OK, now. Look at what's known as the Rongo Rongo text from the Easter Island, um, the Rapa Nui. They have these um, depictions in that that look like these strange objects in the sky, like um, what you would describe as being like these. If you get these massive 
a massive solar event that creates these electromagnetic discharges out before ahead of it. And then you would have things like the Earth being bombarded by co cosmic rays from these coronal mass ejections. Out ahead of those events, you would always get these plasma discharges. And um, Robert Schock realized that these um, depictions in the Rongo Rongo text and like and out in Mohenjo Daro in Pakistan and a number of other ancient legends and maybe even like related to the Nazca line stuff in um, down in Peru is that this may have been a way for these ancient cultures were seeing these things in the sky. And those would always um, be the pre um, predecessor or, or precursor, I should say, of these massive solar events. Now imagine if the sun went through these cyclical events that would cause a huge discharge, I mean a massive discharge of of energy into our inner solar system and they would basically hit earth and cause a weakening of the magnetic fields and the ozone and those cosmic rays would get through in certain places mm, okay they yeah. would basically penetrate the earth in different places <clears throat> i highly recommend a movie people watch that doesn't get any attention it, it's it's very sad but go watch the movie the core not that that movie is highly accurate when they start going down to the core at all. You can stop the movie before that. But the part I want people <laughs> to see is that before that happens, there's this um, moment where scientists are uh, – they have computer um, – Basically, they're they're they have computer data where they're looking at how the magnetic field and the and the ozone is having these holes open up in different parts of the Earth, and they're like freaking out because they don't know what that, what's going to happen when that occurs. And in the movie, there's a scene with the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco where a hole opens up where these these cosmic rays come through and bombard and hit the Earth, and they're able to like basically like melt the bridge almost. But it's in one spot. And that's what I want people to wrap their heads around is that in certain locations around the world, we find this extreme vitrification where it's obviously it's not the whole planet or would have like literally like vaporized life everywhere in the planet. But it's like these holes open up in different parts of the earth and it's these cosmic rays are able to come through. And we're talking about temperatures in the surface when that happens that exceeded 2000 degrees. So if you were on the earth, if you were on the surface, you'd be vaporized. Wow. Okay. Now, so you see vitrification on, on structures around the world. And by the way, Eridu, images of Eridu, of the ziggurat of Eridu, have vitrified rocks on the top of it. Another piece of evidence for how old it is. Okay. As well as seashells covering it from a, a cataclysm, a flood. So we're talking about um, cosmic rays bombarding coming through. You're talking about a weakening of the magnetic sphere of the Earth, the poles shifting, the axis shifting, all the tectonic plates shifting, bizarre weather, ocean currents being disrupted, crazy weather, global wildfires, um, volcanoes going off everywhere, tectonic shifts, <clears throat> uh, plates eventually shifting, creating tsunamis everywhere, massive earthquakes. It's just that's what would happen if you had one of these events with our sun. That is this something that would create something like a black mat like Randall Carlson found? Yeah, because the black mat, I believe, would be associated with both the burning from the sun coming through these holes as well as literally like global wildfires. Mm. You would also get plasma discharges with lightning from all the electricity in the sky, and it would basically have dry lighting strikes across the whole planet. And if you had – climatic disruptions at the same time with mega droughts and things like that you would have situations where wildfires could literally like surround different parts of the planet and it would create a layer of black um area of soil from both vitrification and fires and all these various extreme events that would leave this signature in different places in the world it's not a, it's not necessarily a perfectly consistent layer everywhere it's like these sections of it and that would to me would make more sense because if you had a cosmic impact where it hit the earth, that would just sort of spread that all over the world. But we find it right. somewhat sporadic in different places, which I think is indicative of the ozone and these holes opening up where he's able to get through all these different places around the earth. That's very fascinating because like you said, yeah, it's not something that's found all over the world. It's just kind of localized to a certain area. Didn't they find, not to digress again, didn't they find a crater from what took out the dinosaurs near the Yucatan? I mean, that's yeah, not but to say, we're, we're talking asteroids. about 65 right. million years ago if that's we're able to accurately date 
if we're yeah. if we're accurate in dating that event. Right. But the thing is that when you go back to dating something that old, it's it's very difficult to know exactly when that event occurred. And I'm not convinced that I'm not I'm frankly not convinced that an asteroid destroyed the dinosaurs. Hmm. I'm playing with a theory that our binary companion when it was in aphelion very very far away because it has a massive ellipt elliptical rotation something so big that when it's at its furthest point i think it's when you start getting into these events that trigger like ice ages that's something um, i wanted to ask you about explain if you did uh, briefly or however much you want to go into that the notion of us having us being yeah, yeah, a binary yeah, star system um, but but before i get to that i just want to okay. mention about the dinosaurs is i i believe that if, if let's just say the 65 million year date was real, let's just say it is it just for hypothetical sake. And the reason I say that, well, when we think about uh, seasons on the earth and, and, and um, the precession of the equinox, which is basically a wobbling of the earth, that's what creates the seasons. OK, it's this right. axis tilt that has maybe tilted multiple times. But when the dinosaurs existed and uh, we have dinosaur bones right down where I am in Colorado, where you can go find them. And so for people that are strangely are deniers of dinosaurs, which is odd, but we have <laughs> there's bones all over the world where, yes, there were these giant creatures that lived, these these lizards that lived on the earth, and they were all destroyed in a series of events on the earth. During that time, though, Jeffrey, there weren't seasons. OK, this is what we need to think about. The earth didn't have seasons. It was this very, very warm planet. Antarctica was green. We know that because of fossilized, fossilized plants that we found when we drilled down and found uh, rock, we find fossils in Antarctica, where it showed that was once a green place that had jung a jungle environment with plants, right? So that means at one point, the Earth had no seasons and it was a very warm, warm place. Now, something happened on the Earth to cause it an axis shift that created the precession that created seasons. That's the event that I think believe destroyed the dinosaurs. Now, yes, mm. that can happen with a massive impact because you can hit the earth and then change the axis based on that. However, it can also happen with a supernova. So imagine, if you will, um, a binary companion. And I'll get into the – we can briefly get into that data really quick too for people because that's a very compelling theory that I think explains basically everything. Including this, it's including this, the, the disruption of the – the disappearance of the dinosaurs that – I mean some became birds later on, but – and then um, the avian the avian connection. But then there, of course, there's the idea of, well, when did the earth – when did the precession of the equinox occur? When did the earth start having seasons? When did all that occur? I'm playing with the idea that the this binary companion star um, that we have went into a supernova because it's a more ancient star than our current one. And it supernova But it was at aphelion because if it had supernova at perihelion, which means closest to the sun, it would have destroyed our entire solar system. It didn't. And aphelion means? Furthest, the furthest away. Okay. So I have um, – imagine elliptical orbits so, so vast. We're talking billions and billions of miles away. Something so far you can't see it. You can only get a signature with you when you send probes out. Um so when this um, – I postulate that when this binary star was in aphelion, the furthest away it could, it exploded. The reason we know that, Jeffrey, is because the Pioneer data came back to show that it was a dead star, meaning it died. Mm. And when stars die, they usually supernova. That's how they die. And so for it to be described explicitly through the signatures that were identified from the pioneer probes, and we can go in a little bit of that history, is that this is a dead star, which gives me the evidence to show that it once supernova Well, where do we have an event on Earth that was so extreme that it literally changed the entire planet, gave us seasons, and wiped out all this, most of the species that existed there? One of the greatest wow. mass extinctions in all of human history. It makes a lot more sense to me. That if this star was dead now, that it had supernova in the past, and that's the perfect place in my mind to place that that, that event occurred was probably, if, if the dating is accurate, 65 million years ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. I, and I'm gonna, I don't want to go like super deep into this because I've talked about it a lot. And I don't want to bore people. And not that it's a boring thing at all, but we need to understand that – 
you know, first of all, I got to throw this out there because it's, people leave so many comments on my channel and it's, we need to identify something. NASA has not lied about everything in the past. Yeah, they lied about a lot of the moon stuff. And then there was a big tighten up information after certain periods. And then we, a lot of things became lies. But not everything was a lie. Some of the things they told us were true. Like, for instance, when they were trying to find what was disrupting the gravitational um, orbits of our outer planets. They didn't know. In the 1960s, they were looking at why Neptune um, and Uranus were like tilted on their axis and why even our inner solar system was seemed to be disrupted in this in this elliptic orbit. Something was gravitationally disrupting our entire solar system, but on a consistent level, Jeffrey. This is the thing that's most important. There's something out there that was causing our entire inner solar system to be disrupted. Okay, so they didn't know what it was. So in the 1970 to 1973, they sent two probes out called Pioneer 10 and 11. They sent them out into different quadrants of our solar system. They wanted it because they didn't know where it was. They didn't know what was causing it. This is when things were much more open. They would give press announcements and they would like talk about stuff. It was much less cover, um, uh, covered up than it is now. Right. And they and they said that, oh, so oh, we're sending out the Pioneer probes and then – we're sending them these different directions, and they were excited. This was um, this was before the Voyager probe, and they sent they sent them out. And then in 1983, they detected something. They left our inner solar system in 1983, and all of a sudden they detected something. Both of them did, and this is what is so compelling and important to talk about, is that NASA came out in the early 1990s before they detected the second object and they just, they were open to talk about it. they were like hey everyone mm -hmm. we det and i remember I, that the, you can't even find this quote online anymore i've had people message me they've gone in to try to find this quote and it doesn't exist anymore this was completely scrubbed from the internet as was all of the pioneer data except for one place and i'll and i'll briefly mention that in a second but we need to understand that this became the event that caused them to stop talking about everything besides the moon stuff which of course they found stuff on the moon and there was other events on the moon but this was like the even bigger event that then made them shut up and they and they they basically have misled us since but what happened was they discovered a planet and the, and the quote is like the press announcement was from like 1991 or i think and they came out and they were like they told everyone in the public that they had found a planet four to five times the size of Earth beyond the Kuiper Belt, way out, that was in, a, in an extreme elliptic orbit. It did not come through our inner solar system, but it was out there. It was like this planet that is very difficult to see because it um, there's no there's no illumination of it. Okay, and they were excited. They like told everyone about it, and but they were they determined that its mass was not big enough to be <clears throat> to account for the gravitational disruptions in our entire solar system. There was something else. This planet had a companion star. This is where things start to get wild. Years later, as the Pioneer probes are going further and further out, they detect an object 50 billion miles from Earth. We're talking. Well, actually, 50 billion miles from the Pioneer probes, which were already in the outer solar system. It's like almost inconceivable for us to understand how far out this was. OK, yeah. Yeah. it's so we're talking about a um, a binary companion to our sun that exists out there that they determined with. And, and I, I got to back up. They there was no announcement made on the binary. There's there was nothing. In fact, all information on this was silenced after that event in the early 19, 1990s. After they found the planet, they then found the binary companion star, and that's when this whole conspiracy started. When all of this was, was shut down, all the information was quieted, and we had two major astronomers, primary astronomers that were very, very well known, Thomas Van Flanden and Robert Harrington. Robert Harrington was the head of the U.S. Navy astronomy program, and both of them died, mysteriously died, relatively in the same time period and they were the two primary people looking into this and they both mysteriously they both died of throat cancer both of them that's just a coincidence they both died of throat cancer 
And they were the two people that were looking into this. And, and after they die, all of their um, mathematics of, of determining this outer, this planet that NASA had announced, NASA had announced it. It's not just them. They were looking into the date of the Pioneer probes. But they said they came along and a guy named Miles Standish, it was an astro head of the astronomy department, came along after they died and said that everything they, they had said about this planet, it was all mathematical in calculations. And the whole thing was buried. Okay? Wow. The whole thing was buried. You want a conspiracy? It's right there, right in front of you. Go yeah. look into those two men. The whole thing was buried. You never heard anything else about that. And their announcement of that planet went totally quiet. You never heard anything else about it again. I don't know if people remember. Like, do people on this, like, listening to this right now, there's got to be people out there that remember the, the early 1990s when they made that announcement. It was something like, I'm paraphrasing, we discovered a planet four to five times the size of Earth beyond the Kuiper belt in a long elliptical orbit, something blah, blah, blah. Like it was, Is this it was, in any way related to the planet X that's supposedly yes. at a 3,600 uh, year orbit? No, but that the 3,600 thing was completely a miscalculation. That was that was the the num the na uh, the number used for shars in the Sumerian civilization. That was a Sitchin that was a Sitchin thing that had nothing to do with a planet. It's, it's not. There's no planet comes through our inner solar system. It would destroy everything. That number is a, is a how they the Sumerians measured time. 3,600 years was a shar. It was how they determined ages, their time mm. period. They, they would say one shar, two shar. So like one shar would be 3,600 years. It was how they determined. That's how gotcha. they calculated, Jeffrey, that's how they calculated the ages in the Sumerian king list. They would mention how long the kings ruled in shars. So then they would figure out what a shar was, and then they would add it up, and that's how they came up with that. You had posted something the other day on Facebook, a little drawing you had done. I found very fascinating how basically we're, we're basically still using the measurement of time that the ancient Sumerians used as far as hours in a day extrapolated by the diameter of the sun. And it was very fascinating. Yeah, because it's all been calculated in, in perfection. The ancient the ancients were perfect. So but that's so that's what that 3600 thing is. I don't want people to be confused about that. But yes, um, Robert Harrington referred to it as like planet nine because it or planet 10 at the time because pluto wasn't demoted yeah pluto, so it was pluto planet 10 and 10 is the roman num numeral is x that's where planet x comes from uh, the whole oh, okay. entire concept of planet x comes from this data from the pioneer probes and it comes from the robert harrington this is what the whole thing comes from it was this wow. planet okay and that, and they called it Planet X or Planet Ten. That eventually became Planet Nine. And so, okay, the planet though is only there because it has an extreme elliptical orbit over another star. It does not have an orbit around our sun. It's a it's a separate entity. Okay. Now we're talking about. So remember, I said in 1983 the Pioneer probes in completely different directions of the solar system. This is what I want people to really, really wrap their heads around. Imagine if you have a consistency where our whole solar system has this gravitational disruption that's that's um, equivalent based on distance to every object in our solar system, okay? And the pioneer probes going in completely different directions of our solar system both identify what they called equal pull. Now, where is all this coming from? The Pioneer data was all scrubbed on the internet. You go on the internet right now and you look for what they found, you're not going to find anything. I'm telling you, there was a mass scrubbing mm. and people think that can't exist. This is the best example for mass scrubbing I think I've ever seen any of any subject. They mass scrubbed the internet on Pioneer data. And the only place it lives now, because Robert Harrington's data was all destroyed, the only place it lives now is in the 1987 Science and Invention Encyclopedia. In which they didn't talk about it at all. They said, oh, the Pioneer probe was sent out and blah, blah, blah. They never even mentioned anything, but there's this diagram. And of course, I talk about this all the time, but I want people to know about this. Go on my website, thestageoftime.com, and on the main page, scroll down about a little less than halfway. I have a PDF, high-definition version of that page to save so that it never gets lost. <clears throat> on there is a diet is the only thing that exists to this day that survived from the pioneer data. How that survived in that encyclopedia or what the story is, who knows? But all I can tell you is that the the entire description in that 
never once discusses what's in the diagram, which is kind of bizarre, right? If you imagine if you have if you post a diagram in an encyclopedia that shows these bizarre things like a binary companion star, and then you don't even talk about it. So obviously that got redacted and, and removed and it wasn't able to be put in the encyclopedia. But for yeah. some reason the diagram was. What do you think the rationale is for concealing this information? Well, that's the thing is that the reason why the entire reason why NASA went quiet after they found that planet was because they they found its binary companion to our sun, its binary star companion. And they realized after they ran models that it was causing the, the catastrophes and, and the cyclical nature of disasters and what I believe is glaciation on the earth. It's the sole responsibility for what is causing these cycles of disaster. Now, if people remember, if they've done, if seen, um, there's a paper called the Adam and Eve story that is, that's a released document because of the Freedom Information Act that came out of the CIA. And the Adam and Eve story goes into the biblical and pre-biblical accounts of the flood. And in that, they discuss this cycle of catastrophes that occurs every, every 13,000 years. They knew about it. This was like the 1950s and 60s and 70s they had this. They already knew. They knew the cycle existed, but they didn't know what was causing it. Okay? So imagine, if you will, this is the equivalent of, imagine, if you will, you are a government entity that discovers that there's an asteroid headed for Earth in a certain amount of years. You would never, ever tell the public because it would cause mass panic. Right. And so the same thing occurred where they discovered this planetary binary, this planetary um object and then this companion to it it was a binary of our sun they ran models figured out oh my god this is what's causing cycles of catastrophe and boom they knew that they couldn't talk about it they knew that they couldn't discuss this at all and um believe it or not it even relates to 9-11 that's like a whole st- <laughs> i'm telling you hole. the entire 9-11 story is actually i believe connected to this for people that want to go like ultra deep down the rabbit hole. Um, I, and I'll, I'll briefly mention it because people are going to know what I'm talking about. But yeah, you got my attention. This, okay, you want to know, check this out. Talk about going deep. And there's a lot of evidence to prove this. You find out that in the 1990s, after NASA went silent on this, on finding this event, they um, started, um, the, the government and, and certain powerful elites started building these massive underground um, bunkers in areas around the country. Like we have documentation of it. There's actually some whistleblowers that have even posted pictures on some of them that um, Mount and Weather. We, and That's one of them. Mount Weather. We know this not only because of that documentation that came out, but, but if you look into the story of 9-11, what the whole reason why that whole th- that the primary reason I should say not because I know they wanted to invade Iraq to steal antiquities and have a war on terror. I know that was like a secondary. That's another reason. But the primary reason that this was all started was because there was um, a hearing done. Remember this, Jeffrey? Maybe you know that. I don't remember the exact date. There was a hearing done where the government was trying to figure out where trillions of dollars went. Remember this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Day before 9-11, Rumsfeld said that. Exactly. Rumsfeld's involved. They're trying to figure out where like uh, – I don't remember the exact number. Someone's going to have to quote me, but it's like it was like a hundred – it was like hundreds of trillions of dollars. They were trying to figure out where all this money went Okay, in the government trying to figure out where it went. And they knew these hearings were coming. They black knew projects. They, were, they knew they were coming and they called them black budget money. And where that money had gone was traced back to these huge underground areas that had been built. That had wow. been built because I think the whole thing ties to the fact that how is it a coincidence that this happened right after they discovered this binary companion? There's no way that's a coincidence. They discover the binary companion that they determined was a dead star that was 50 billion miles. They ran models. They figured out what it is, how it comes through perihelion, comes by our sun, causes our sun to go through massive coronal mass ejections as it goes by, basically throwing this um, charged particles at the earth and basically destroying civilizations. They figured out that this is happening. They figured out, hey, we're 13,000 years ago, just about before the, since the last event occurred. And the Earth is warming at an alarming rate. And whenever that binary companion comes by, it causes the sun to heat up extremely hot, which is why all the, why we're so warm. That's the reason. Mm, wow. Okay? 
right? So they so figured... then, Well, I'm sorry. The towers, yeah, I mean, the, I'm just like the taking out the towers, Shawshank, or not Shawshank, Shanksville. So, Pentagon. okay, well, let me, let me go into that then. So what happened was they know they're in trouble because they're having these government hearings, hearings where Rumsfeld is on trial and they're asking the government, literally high-end government, they're doing probes into figuring out where trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars went, just disappeared, poof. This is, if people that don't know this part of 9-11, this is like crucial to understand the story. They are on trial and they're like, um, can you tell us where it, it went? And Rumfeld's like, well, I, I, don't, I don't know, I'll get back to you in a day, right? <laughs> I'll get back to you in a day. And so um, what happens a day later? The, the towers are hit. What were the what was the significance of those towers? Those towers and building tower a building eight was where all the financial documents were held. All building of them. seven or building or, seven. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, building seven and the in the in the towers was where all of the documents for the government and all these projects. That's where it was all stored. If, did you know that? Um, I, mean, like, I, had, I mean, like all of it. Like I had heard there was a bunch of stuff stored in building and and seven and um and in certain floor. The, the towers. Yeah, yeah. They were financial centers with government levels of high level government areas where all of the finances were kept on that had documentation on these projects. So the idea was that the probe in that was in with Rumsfeld was going to find and go in go through those records. Okay. Wow. Yeah. They were going to go through those records. And that was the major reason why 9 11 happened. So <laughs> they're working bad. with the Saudi wow. government. They're working with the Saudi government because that's one of our number one allies over oil and yeah. that works with us. And they, they created a scheme to have some, some, you know, some Saudis, because we know there were Saudis, we found there were like driver's licenses yeah. involved in basically what was, I think it was like, an, an operation was known as was that operation do you remember what the, there was an original it wasn't high jump no, no that was the one in, in the north itself that was the one in antarctica there was a someone's gonna send me, send me the post the name i can't remember off my head there was an operation that was um had been designed by the military where they would um basically have a scenario play out where terrorists could hijack planes and then they would north, talk all northwoods? about Northwoods. thank you operation northwoods thank you. yeah thank you thank you thank you operation northwoods is exactly what played out Go read Operation Northwoods. It'll blow your mind. It is the exact scenario that they had designed, but for how they would um, counter it in case it ever happened. And so what happened? The day of 9-11, it just happens to be this massive NORAD, this massive um, training operation for like 98% of all fighter jets in the United States were stationed in Alaska. Yeah, they were uh, all Webster, gone. Tarp, Webster Tarpley wrote a book called uh, Synthetic Terror, where there was like almost a hundred different war games simulating the same exactly. scenario, the scenario that played out that same day. And there was one spot also in the Pentagon where they had the documents held, right? So you had Building Seven, the towers, and then this one corner of the Pentagon that they had these documents stored. So they had a systematic event play out to. Basically, we know if you look at the Pentagon, there's no disruption of the grass. We know that a cruise missile hit there. There's even yeah. video footage from somewhere nearby that was finally released that shows that, where they literally targeted these locations, wiped out all evidence, and then created this patriotic event to, to and killed a lot of people to then invade Iraq, which then led to the deaths of like a million people. Yeah, they don't mind taking out some people for their larger agendas, that's for sure. But... Regardless of your looks, you're looking into that, looking at based on oil rights and all these um, gas and oil rights and the stealing of antiquities. The primary reason was to hide the evidence of trillions and trillions of dollars that had gone into building these underground bunkers. OK, wow. They had built those underground bunkers because they were extremely concerned that this binary because of the cyclical basis nature of these events was going to destroy our civilization. I know that's a very like long story no, to get back to the gross. original point. No, that's all right. And so we're, I mean, like you, I get said before, like we're on the clock's ticking where that's, it's coming. Is it not, are we not due for well, that? Here's the thing that happened. Notice how no one's down there right now. 
that project seems to have been kind of put on the wayside, you would have elites around the world on like green screens. You would have them down there. It would be a situation there would be like prepping for that. It was obviously determined because there was a huge project put into place. And I don't know what their government name for pro that project is. I'm not privy to that. But they did a two-part global program to prevent that event. So this gets into your question on if we're about to be destroyed. And the answer is no. And I would like to strongly point out that this would be the first time that our civilization has ever existed here that made it through one of these cycles. I've been wondering for a long time, last few years, I've been seeing a lot of like mass resignations of CEOs and politicians throughout the apex of their career. Like, no, I'm not going to run again. And I was, I always just kind of wondered just in the back of my mind, like, why is everybody dipping out? And I've always, I've known about, about Mount Weather and places like that, but I don't know. That's, that's so fascinating. Are you, are you one of the, are you other people delving or speculating? Oh yeah. As far There's, as this is known in high levels. The thing is not everybody might, might believe it. I mean, I mean, in terms of us preventing it, Ima imagine you have this consensus based on the scientists, the astrophysicists they have working for them on this global two part program that I could explain, which has so much evidence behind it to tie this in um, that maybe maybe a lot of them don't believe it's going to work. So they decide they want to go live out their years and do whatever they can to enjoy that, because I want to go into what that program is. In the 1990s, again, think about the correlation here, okay? It's this is it's too many things that correlate to be a, to be a coincidence. You have this announcement of the planet in the early 90s, then it disappears, all of it's buried, they find the binary star, right? All this stuff happens and then um you have these events with the the, the black budgets disappearing, the underground stuff being built. But then all of that kind of goes quiet and these and then, then these two major projects get developed. The two projects are, they, de they determined that they could do a combination of two things that they felt confident enough that could prevent this event. The two programs was a massive global geoengineering program to use aerosols into the upper stratosphere. They're called stratos stratospheric aer aerosol injections in the stratosphere, stratospheric, to basically prevent um, these cosmic solar rays that are bombarding the planet because it's happening now. It, out ahead of this, we're in it right now. Uh, this, this, this is this chemtrails? Companion, is this the role of chemtrails? Yes. This this binary companion is getting close to our sun right now. It's happening. And so right now, while the Earth is warming and you're getting all of these cosmic rays bombarding the Earth, we know that because the poles are already shifting. Mm. We already know that. They're not hiding that. They're talking about how they have to fly out to take new readings to fix because of because of um, using GPS and using all these global positioning devices. We already know that the poles are shifting. The Inuit have talked about it. We know that's happening in conjunction with the warming. It all makes complete sense. They're how is, I'm sorry, ago. If, regardless of what we're spraying into the atmosphere, how will that stop the impact of like the poles shifting in such okay, a short period so, of time? So, yeah, I can explain that. So. Imagine as a two-part process. The first part is that they, and, and they as in people in the government, but you can go look and find documentation on them um, talking all about how this is like a hypothetical thing where they could, they could do these highly reflective materials to prevent cl climate change and all these different things. Right. But one of the very interesting aspects that came out there was articles that have come out that have said wait a minute some of the warming of the earth seems to be related to the fact that the heat loss in the atmosphere is seems to be significantly different in the last um 30 years than it used to be the, the heat's not leaving the atmosphere there it's funny there was there was articles that have come scientific papers that have come out that have been really um, perplexing and looking at how the heat loss based on our atmosphere seems to be really different than it used to be, which may, which they equate to the major reason why this warming is occurring, not industrial activities. Anyway, the point is there's, there's a global program that's, occur that's around the world that you can see if you know, if you know, artificial clouds at all, this cloud seeding program that they're seeding um, this aerosol aluminum and other metals that's been 
very well documented in many places in the upper yeah. atmosphere. You can see it all around the world. It's not contrails. They don't disappear. They grow into mm -hmm. giant clouds and it turns all cloudy, but it's a, they're very strange looking. They have like this weird, like filtered look. Um, if you know what they look like, that program is a global program that John, um, that is talked about in the Senate and during some of these committee meetings where they um, discuss how it's not a very expensive project because aluminum is a byproduct of a lot of our operations we do today where mm -hmm. they can they can put that in the upper atmosphere and they can reflect a certain amount of these solar charged particles back into space. So they don't end up just coming into the earth and then disrupting the earth as much at the same time. It in winds up trapping the heat inside inside. The yeah, that's the byproduct of it. But at yeah. the same time, while that's going on, you're seeing um, all of these very strange things that are going on in Antarctica. Very strange. You're seeing um, government entities from around the world that have these bases down in Antarctica. And I, I, I postulate or I bring up the idea like, well, how many ice cores can, can you take before you're done? You have them all. Yeah, so, what, yeah, exactly. so what are they doing? What are they doing in Antarctica with these secret places in Antarctica? And I believe based on the toroidal field of Earth and how energy and how the magnetosphere works with Earth, that that's where if you were going to do something to manipulate, to try to prevent the poles shifting and to protect the Earth from wobbling and, and, sh and having a complete disaster occur, you would have to manipulate it down in Antarctica. So at the same time, Look at how Nikola Tesla had all of this um, incredible technology coming out for free energy and affecting the uh, using magnetism come out that just was buried and disappeared. I firmly believe that after everything I've looked at, that it's this two pronged approach. You going drilling these massive holes in Antarctica down into the earth and using some kind of artificial technology to prevent this shift of, of our planet um basically like shifting the poles by by i think artificially shifting them the opposite way basically like counter like a, like a like a, a top spinning they're able to basically shift it the other way so that when that shift occurs it can kind of balance and counter itself as well as reflecting these charged particles in the in the upper atmosphere back onto space so i i believe based on what i've seen to connect that whole story that they're looking at the percentage chance that that's going to be successful and that it has a high level chance of success right now which is why nobody's freaking out okay wow. to make a long story short well i mean like um, i said they're still building some of those uh like mount weathers just in case of course oh, and let of course. me let me ask i mean obviously we have way more technology now than they used to have in the ancients but going back to them understanding the cycles of these cataclysms you got places like darren kuyu which is in cappadocia yes. turkey basically it's an underground city yeah. Is that did they build that because they knew something like that was coming? Exactly. Now look, look at Turkey is this centerpiece of the world, which is like at the crossroads of the Fertile Crescent, as well as a lot of the civilizations that were to the west of it. It's sort of the, the center point, way far inland, where um, they have this specific type of um, limestone bedrock. Well, actually, it's not limestone. It's a type of um, volcanic ash, ancient volcanic ash that formed these deep layers that are very easily manipulated. OK, so the ancients figured out that these catastrophes occur, which is why I think the primary reason Gobekli Tepe existed. Gobekli Tepe being an astronomical library that was mapping out the precession of the equinoxes and the different cycles is that they knew based on the sole survivors of those other civilizations, they knew that these events were occurring. And I actually would go as far to say that the reason why a lot of the pyramidal structures like Giza built in this specific location on the 30th parallel, uh, as it was, along with some other locations around the world, may have been the attempt by that civilization to try to prevent these events. If, as in a gigantic resonant frequency device built in a specific part of the earth that maybe was able to somehow try to balance some of that energy on the planet to prevent these events. And they, we find evidence in the great pyramid of Giza of certain shafts that exploded, exploded mm. from an over, um, overcharging of energy that basically overwhelmed them. So I think that this was, I really do believe this was very well known throughout these ancient civilizations. And they knew that, 
other civilizations had been unsuccessful with preventing them or just hadn't survived. And so what they did was they constructed the largest area of underground cities in the world in Derinkuyu. There are some think up to 200 underground cities, but for primary ones, there's like a dozen at least. Derinkuyu is the most well-known one, but they basically have these incredibly immense underground cities that have been created with these gigantic circular doorways that could be rolled over to, to lock and seal everybody in. But they did it in a way where it was all connected through air shafts and individual rooms where you could have animals living and then people living and then areas to prepare meals and areas to literally like survive underground for large amounts of time. And you would do that if you were going through one of these cycles where certain times of the earth was you couldn't even be on the surface or you'd be like vaporized or yeah. tsunamis potentially going through or gigantic um, fires, all these different these events that were going on. This was a place that was used by civilizations for thousands and thousands of years over and over again, which is why we find tools and evidence of, of other civilizations like the Hittites and others that were are in there but didn't create it originally. Wow. Man, I'm keeping you a long time, and I just have a couple more okay. questions for you. But, yeah. uh, so you guys, uh, some of you guys' plans, you, Billy Carson, um, Rex Bear, I, I forget who I was going down there with you, but you guys are heading down to South America, Tiwanaku, Pumapunku, and just I'm just thinking as you're talking about the heat and stuff, some of the megalithic structures down there, as you pointed out, and as have been seen, I think they're like H blocks. They're just huge stones that clearly weren't made by, um, you know, Bronze Age tools, Sexay Woman, to be ex for an example. But I remember there was one of them, I think you pointed out, there's huge scorching on one side of it which was, means it obviously was exposed to huge amounts of heat and on the other side but anyway what are you guys going to do down in peru because you guys got a plan to go down there here i think this fall or sometime soon yeah and and speak to the like they said the megalithic structures that are to be found down there tiwanaku pumapunku uh, machu picchu etc well we're going to try to get to bolivia that's in bolivia we don't know if we're going to be able to get we're definitely going to get to peru but in november at the end of november we're going to be taking a trip uh, Billy Carson and I and Jay Campbell, and we're going to be meeting up with Brian Forster, hopefully for a few days. We're going to be going down and seeing um, some of the primary megalithic sites like Machu Picchu, Saskatchewan, Oyate Tambo, and some others, Cusco as, as well. And we're going to be discussing the different layers of civilizations, evidence of destruction, vitrification, discussing those civilizations, um, what had occurred with them. Uh, and we're going to be filming and doing some, some really exciting stuff down there during that time. But yeah, that's a perfect place to describe and show the different civilizations that have come and gone before the Younger Dryas and how there's distinct layers that show that, as well as the vitrification and some of the evidence of that destruction on some of those structures as well um, that just shows and you know backs up that these events occurred to them um, and how they um, most of them were destroyed and had to try to rebuild or carry on and a later civilization that came that came after and found the ruins. So that'll be an exciting trip. Uh, really looking forward to working with uh, with Brian and getting down there with Billy and doing that. It's just an awesome meeting of the minds. You guys are so obviously passionate and knowledgeable about what you do. And specifically that sexy, I'm thinking, it sounds like sexy woman, but obviously that's not what it is, sexy woman or something like that. But yeah. just seeing, seeing that like the huge, however many ton rocks and how they were molded and there was no mortar and you could like slip a piece, you can't even slip a piece of paper in between them. Like that wasn't Bronze Age tool stuff. But like you talked about, you could see where the, where the, where the geology and the architecture changed where obviously it was, you know, one kind of, uh, one type at one level and then on top it was obviously the incans who built on top of something yeah. that was way more advanced in their capability yeah they they um in what we think of as the inca was actually all the evidence now is pointing that they had nothing to do with that big megalithic stuff that they actually found um, they were a group that had survived as an indigenous group in the Amazon and during those events because they had those skills and capabilities, which is who would survive if we had that happen today. But they came out of the jungle and found the ruins of those civilizations. And then yeah. that's why it's so primitive. That's why the work they did with the mortar on top is so primitive in comparison to the other stuff below. Yeah, so fascinating. Well, and before I let you slide, you had sent me something. I definitely wanted to touch on this because this is very, very important. Um, you had sent me something called Reflections on the Mesota Mesopotamian Flood, and it was an article written by Samuel Noah Kramer. And it was basically an archaeological dig, which pretty much substantiated um, a cataclysm that took place in Ur and Shurupak and basically the flood myth. Speak to that if you can. 
Sure. This is an awesome paper that I recently found that I highly encourage people to go check out and, and see online. It's called, yeah, Reflections on the Mesopotamian Flood, Flood by Samuel Noah Kramer, who is one of my favorite experts of ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian um, studies. He's one of the most well-versed in the world. I would put him right up there with Stephanie Daly and George Smith. Uh, he's fin phenomenal. He's got some great books out. But this paper was an academic paper written for Penn Museum. And it was published in 1967, quite a while ago. He discusses in that how the, the stories that are um, carried over throughout the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, all have this correlation with, with them how about these great catastrophes, these deluges, in every single story and how there were cities that existed before, like Eridu, which I want to just quickly point out, satellite image of that, go on Google Maps now, they've totally blurred out that whole area which is, I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but they blurred out that whole area of Eridu, which I don't know if that's because I've, we've been, I've been talking about it and make a big fuss about it, but they've blurred out just the area around Eridu now. Go check it out. It's hilarious. Not really funny, but in terms of thinking about how that could, uh, the impacts of that, because it's, it's if you look outside of the area of Eridu, it's all like clear and normal imagery, and now around Eridu, it's all been blurred. So check that out. Um, but those cities... Um, Samuel Kramer talks about how those cities are mentioned as being these pre-Diluvian ancient ancient cities in all the stories, but most academia discredits them as being a myth because how could that be possible? Our story doesn't go back that far. But the, the point of this article was that he talks about how not only do you find correlations in nearly every tablet saying the same thing about those cities and the deluge and descriptions of it, he mentions like five different tablets that all have almost nearly identical information from different civilizations in the Fertile Crescent. But he goes into this, um, this, this study done and includes photos of the excavations of Shurupak. So just like we found Eridu as being a real place, they found the city of Shurupak, which was later called Fara, F-A-R-A. And in that academic paper, they have black and white photographs of excavations that were done showing the um, showing ancient Shurupak was found and excavated. And of course, that's never, ever talked about now, but they actually uncovered it. And they what they found was that the layers they had to go down to get to the actual ruins of Shurupak was completely below this massive accumulation of soil. And he found that perplexing because, again, modern academia had considered those stories to be a myth. And he says that academia had thought it was simply based on the annual river flooding and not actually on like a catastrophic event that occurred, right? Mm -hmm. However, he shows photos of Shurupak in, in the, only place, the only place I've ever seen that shows fit photos of Shurupak. So go check out that paper. Um, you can just search for what I, the title there. But they show um, photos of Shurupak and all the layers they had to go down to find the city. And, and so what Samuel Kramer ends up talking about after that, he says, look, this isn't the only place, the only city in, in Iraq that has been found at that depth. OK, Eridu is another one where they had to go down a certain layer of depth to find the original city buried by these sediments, which would support these catastrophes. But there was a study done. That he includes in this where in 1929 there was a man named Leonard Woolley who was doing excavations throughout the Fertile Crescent area of, of Iraq and they were digging down to try to understand where the layers of these civilizations were. Now we're taught in school that all those civilizations existed you know five five six thousand years ago max and that they right. all were built off of each other part of the same time period. But what Woolley found that supported uh, all the excavations done in Shurupak and Eridu, which were the, were the pre-Diluvian cities before the flood, was that he, he describes how they dug down in virgin foil and found, soil and found civilizations on top, which – because there were later civilizations in that area that came after. That's what's confused in academia is that there were later civilizations that came that were less sophisticated. But he, he talks about in that study how – they dug below that first civilization or set of civilizations, and it was like there was nothing. It was empty, and they almost gave up. That's how far down they were going, is that they went down and down and down, and they went more than eight feet. Imagine how long it takes eight feet of sediment to accumulate. And they couldn't find anything. It was like there was, they were like con confused, but Wooly didn't give up. 
It says that he kept digging and he ended up finding the remnants of a more advanced civilization below a huge layer of soil that he equated to as being the Ubaid civilization, which we know is just the original Sumerians. And so he went and tried to verify that by digging holes in different places of the region. So just so it wouldn't be one place, he found the same thing everywhere. And they even went to the into Kish and found something similar as well, where they found these different layers that would that corresponded with these stories. Now, what Woolley determined, all he could determine based on that was that the, the stories from these ancient civilizations was real. Was that look, we have the evidence. We found the the layers and these increments where they like disappeared for great amounts of time, exactly matching the descriptions of these great catastrophes that went through. And None of Kish, this Kish, is, is, uh, Kish was the first anti post-flood city, was it? Yeah, it, it was. But here's one of the the interesting things is that some of these events have occurred multiple times. And mm. I'm even willing – I'm even – as I've said, I believe that some of these catastrophes – I'm not even fully convinced that the catastrophes mentioned in the Atrahasis was the Younger Dryas. I think it might have even been an earlier event. Mm. So what we're looking at is a complex history yes. that goes back – and has because we know that we that it's been mentioned by the Maya, the Aztecs, mentioned by the temple priests of Sais to Solon. That look, you remember one catastrophe in one set of civilizations, but there have been many that have come before and gone. Could could that be why you know whether it's Adrahasius, Untapishim, Zaya Sutra, it's the same story written in multiple different sets of time because they're talking about basically a flood, but different floods, or are they talking about the same flood? Though in that case. In that case of Zaya Sudra Untapishtim, that's the same person, but in a different a name used in different a different culture. Okay. However, some of those floods, some of the things mentioned, um, we don't actually know when that particular one was. The only date we have is when Atlantis was destroyed, because Plato told us. Right. Okay? okay. But that's why there's it's it's one of those it's it's something that's extremely complex. Sure. And may have happened in different in different time periods over and over again. Interesting. Wow, you've sufficiently blown my mind today, Matthew. <laughs> I'm still on the 9/11 stuff, which that's I got to almost re-listen to this because that's I find that's all of this so so very fascinating. Long story short, ladies and gentlemen, our civilization has come and gone so many times over a very very long period of time, and I just saw one of the posts you made today, and I've. At the end of the movie Higher Learning, it said the word unlearn. And I think you said something about, I think it was a picture of Yoda saying there's so much we have to unlearn. And that's, yeah. there, that's, not, that's so, so very true. Yeah. There's so, I mean, there's so much, this information is so dense. And it goes back to, I mean, I guess I'll, the people talk about the Great Reset. I think one of the first Great Resets was after the fall of Rome, the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire, the Crusades and things like that. You know, the Dark Ages when, you know, they began creating this narrative where they yes. began telling us this false history. If you That's will. when it started. Yep. And the people can go back to the origins of, of St. Patrick's Day that Matthew's talked about. That's, yeah. you know, that was about not getting rid of real reptiles because serpents were actually back in the days were symbols of, of yeah. enlightenment. They were talking yeah. about getting rid of the Druids and the ancient yeah. knowledge that they had. Wow. Yeah. And just and just imagine people deny the idea that the Holy Roman Empire had something to do with rewriting our doctrine to history. Except that the Romans were the ones who were destroying ancient libraries all around the world, including the Library of Alexandria. This yes. is it's all correlated to the fact that they were the civilization that came along to control religion and history and rewrote the whole story. And that's what we're trying to get out of now. Without a doubt. And so that's, that's the beautiful thing of having met you and it, just having this understanding. It's helped me reshape and help informed better, not just, my, you know, my my not just the world and history and the universe, but my place and our place in it. It's just, yeah. this is so very deep. And I know you don't like using the term red pill and I don't, you know, I, I, I you, you gave me, you really hit me up on that because red's like the lower chakra energy or lower color. But this, this information is so very illuminating, ladies and gentlemen. And I, I really, Matt, I know you're a busy guy and I know you said you got some stuff to do today. I didn't mean to keep you so long, but I can't thank you enough for coming by and just blessing us with, your information, your knowledge, your passion for this subject, man. It's its really cool, and I, I thank you, man. Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. I really appreciate you and your diligence in all this information. And we, we've been doing shows for a long time, and I, you always yeah. show so much respect, and I love, I love doing shows with you. 
Well, and I learn I learn more each time. And for every question, I think I have answered. I just have more questions. But I mean, what you what you talked about, I really wanted to hear your stuff on the binary star system because some of your recent work, you you talked about that. And I just I didn't quite get it. And I sent you a picture. Of, you know, I think it was Luke Skywalker on Star Wars where they had they had two sons. And it's this is this has obviously been around longer than I realized. And it's really interesting to find out and to get a better, deeper understanding on what the whole binary star system, et cetera. But all of this information. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys have really enjoyed it. Where can we find you, Matthew? Check out uh, any of the work you've got going and stuff you got coming up. Yeah, so get ready. Um, Billy Carson and I will be releasing the Epic of Humanity, and that is going to be just the – that is the most um, – I, I consider that the most important work I've done yet in terms of writing a book. I really a lot a lot went into that. It's got even more ancient text translations in the stage of time. It is like a time capsule for information. I truly put as much as I could into that to try to protect our story and all of what we're discussing and so much more. I mean, you're I highly um, encourage people get excited about that. That book is gonna. I'm trying to change the narrative with that one. And uh, uh, Billy's finishing it up right now, and we're gonna be releasing. And I'm very excited for people to find that coming out. Get ready for um, ancient civilizations starting in September. And um, don't forget the um, Conscious Life Expo uh, in uh, February if you want to come see me speak live. And, and where all will that of the be? other stuff coming. What would you say? Where will that be? That's going to be in Los Angeles, the Conscious Life Expo. Okay. Um, and, I'll, and you can find me on the schedule soon. We're still um, getting that on there. But a lot of cool, a lot of really, really neat stuff coming. And I just want to say I truly appreciate um, everyone that supports me and does gives so much so much kind support, including you. And you can find my work at thestageoftime.com or my YouTube channel, Matthew LaCroix, uh, Instagram at the Stage of Time, and as well as uh, Facebook and um, maybe some other things coming along in the future. So thanks so much, Jeffrey, and thanks to everyone else. I really appreciate it. For sure. And you also, I can't not mention, you recently got a shout out from our boy Sam Tripley on the Joey Rogan show. That was pretty awesome. I did. And I, I'm hoping, obviously, you know, that I, I put a request in and, I'm, and try to help me guys if you can, but I want to get on uh, Joe Rogan. I think I could uh, change some minds on that and probably change his mind. That'd be some mind blowing stuff. Matthew, I can't thank you enough, my friend. Peace and so much love, respect for all the work you do. And I look forward to just keeping, keep watching you grow, my man. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us once again for another episode. Peace and all that love, respect.